which is a very famous poem, but I didn't know it at the time. But it just said, at the end of time, most men are relegated to a tombstone. On that tombstone are two dates. This person was born, this person died. In between is a dash, but few ask why. And it resonated with me. And I had my mother in my ear saying, you must be there for a reason, figure it out. So I had that in my ear. And then I'm reading this and I'm like, you know what? Whatever happens... Like if they end up executing me, guess what? I'll walk into that gas chamber, head hell high. You know, I'm not going to be fighting and struggling. I'm going to leave them with doubt because I'm going to live an upright life. I'm going to have a life that's impactful. I'm going to create a dash. Even in these circumstances, I'm having a dash because at the end of the day, that's what life's about. Welcome back to the Two for This Shit podcast. I'm your host, Angie Sorensen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. If you're new here, this is an interview-based podcast where you'll find a wide range of topics and guests such as doctors, sex workers, women who escape cults, scientists, psychotherapists, coaches, divorce lawyers, and so many more. When the series is live, I publish every other Monday. Now... This series, this, I can't even say it anymore. This series should go on until the end of October 2024. It could go on longer as well, but I will update you close to the time. Oh my God, I can't wait for you to listen to John. So today, my guest is John Huffington. And I can't even express in words how... Like I've just come off the recording now and I I have like, honestly, um, I don't even know what the right word is. If, cause I don't want to sound, you know, like sometimes people like, you know, sometimes you have can have too many descriptive words and then you sound like it's just, it's just annoying for people. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, uh, honestly, so many good feelings and he is such an incredible like to me, he's a role model. I think he's a definitely a role model. And I really hope that, I really hope that when you listen to him that, oh, I don't even know what to say. Honestly, I think you should just listen to it. It's I'm, I'm literally like I'm lost for words. Um, I read John's book. Basically, the way I came across John is Dr. Louise Hewitt from the London Innocent Project um, did an episode with her. I believe it was last year. And um, at the end of the of the interview with Louise, I asked her, you know, I'm really been looking for someone to interview who's been wrongly wrongfully convicted because I'm really interested in, you know, how you survive that, you know, being wrongfully convicted and who has been exonerated, right? So... And she mentioned John. She said, John Huffington, you have to speak to him. He's incredible. And, and I'm glad I'm glad I got in touch with him. And I'm glad I read his book. And I'm glad that he said yes. And I'm glad that I did an interview with him. And that's why I'm so, so grateful for this podcast. And I am so, so grateful for you listening. Because you... You know, I don't think I would carry on if no one was listening. I don't know. Maybe I would. I mean, that's why I tell people, I say, you should just do it for an audience of one. You should just do your dream and do your podcast. And But that's easier said than done. I think if no one was listening and, um, you know, yeah. So I'm just really grateful for this opportunity um, to, to do this. And, um, yeah. <sighs> Whoa, so many emotions. But all good, like happy, happy emotions. So you know what? I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let the episode do its own talking. I want you to experience John. And so without further ado, please help me give a big, warm welcome to John. Let's begin. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Angie. 
Yeah, no, um, honestly, um, I mean, you may get this a lot, so this may bore you, but I am really honored to have you on the podcast and I read your book and I can't wait to explore your path to freedom, the strength of human spirit and the challenges of rebuilding one's life after experiencing such profound injustice. So before we dive in, John, I am going to start this interview differently than what I usually do. I will go ahead and do a redacted introduction because selfishly, I want to get to the questions. And I also want my listeners to go and buy and read your book, uh, Innocent and Obscene Miscarriage of Justice, because there is so much more to your story than what um, I'm about to say in the introduction, but also for what we will have a chance to cover in this next hour or so. So here's my little intro. Correct me at any time if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you spent more than 32 years in the Maryland prison system for crimes that you did not commit. 10 years were spent on death row. One and a half were spent in supermax. You went in as an 18 year old and you came out around 50. Your book ends with the Alfred plea. But before we start with the interview, I do want to say that since then you were pardoned. You got a full, full pardon by former Governor Larry Hogan in January 2023. So that's 40 years after you got sent to prison. And Hogan declared prosecutorial misconduct in granting a full innocence pardon for you in connection with the 1981 double slaying in Harford County known as the Mo Memorial Day Murders. John, you cleared your name. You did it. And happy Freedom Day for the 11th year on Monday, July the 22nd. Thank you. John, what did that full pardon mean to you? Um, well, that meant everything. You know, there were a lot of like milestones along the way, you know, winning the writ of actual innocence and, you know, walking out the door of prison are certainly milestones themselves. But I think the biggest one had to have been when Governor Hogan took that extraordinary step and gave me, you know, full innocence pardon. And, you know, just put that in perspective, that's very, very uncommon. Um, here in Maryland, the governors have not utilized that power. I, I don't even know how often, but it's so rare. Um, and for him to do that, you know, was everything because it, it gave me my name back, um, you know, more important to me than anything was to reclaim you know my name you know um yeah it, it just put that final stamp on things um you know the evidence had eventually come out with dna and things like that and you know exculpated me cleared me but you know as you pointed out my book ends with an alfred plea and you know there's more to that story which still left you know a cloud of doubt hanging over my head it was just um, I really didn't have any choice when I took that deal. Um, it, it, you know, there was no choice. <laughs> and um, for him just to, 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 to reverse all that and, and, you know, declare me innocent and, and just make that a final statement. And, you know, that's not just one man that just strokes his pen either. You know, there's a whole mm -hmm. process involved in that um, with the governor's legal counsel. And then, you know, the division of parole and probation does this thorough investigation of the facts of the case um so there was a real in-depth investigation that occurred it took you know well over a year to accomplish that task um they were extremely um thorough and supportive in as they processed that and then they presented their findings to governor hogan and he in turn on january 13th the last year signed that innocence pardon and you know that was a, a very, very special day to me. Yeah. And it was a long time coming as well. Really long. Oh, time absolutely. Coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, it's, I think 40 it's some years. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really hard to relate for most, right? I think it's, it's something that only you or anyone else who lives it can truly understand. But that's like, but you know, the, um, I do have a question like with the Alfred plea, like obviously I understood it was really hard, um, for you to take, um, why did it have such a significant toll? What's, what's the big difference between that and the full pardon? Well, 
so your listeners understand there's a case and it's called Alfred versus North Carolina. And it's, it's just this weird hybrid sort of plea deal that is in a prosecutor's arsenal to offer. Mm -hmm. And usually it's offered to somebody that's still in prison that might have won a new trial, but hasn't come home or, you know, there's no bail attached, something like that. And what they do is they dangle that out there and say, okay, you know, you've got this new trial, we can do this whole another process and it can take three to five years. And meanwhile, you're going to sit in prison where your daily existence is not guaranteed. You know, that's a day-to-day -day survival in there. Yeah. Or you can take this thing called an Alfred plea and come home tomorrow. Well, the thing about an Alfred plea is for somebody that's innocent, you basically sell your soul because it, the, 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 the outcome of an Alfred plea is you, the individual, get to maintain your innocence. But basically you're saying that the state has enough evidence to possibly convict you or that the deal is in your best interest. So while you in your head basically get to say, well, I'm still innocent, they, they get a conviction on the record, but it ends everything. So, you know, there's no more prison time. It's just over with. Um, but there's a conviction on your record. Mm. So for me, I was, I was home. I'd been home for, I don't know, four and a half years pending a new trial. You know, I won a rid of actual innocence in 2013, came home July 22nd, and I had to post a half a million dollar cash bail to come home. Mm. So I come home, I'm on bail, um, you know, and I'm trying to figure out the world after 32 years of not being here. I'm trying to launch a career, you know, reintegrate into society, find my lane, you know, learn the social norms again, you know, have a personal life, all those things. And I'm facing a double murder trial. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you're trying to balance this. Um, you're basically, you know, living your life with one foot on a banana peel. And in my case, you know, I, you know, yes, there was pros prosecutorial misconduct. Um, my prosecutor was told about the evidence in my case by the FBI almost 14 years earlier, and he covered it up. Yeah. And I would not find that out until 2013 that he was told in 1999 and then covered it up. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many aspects in your story that it, it honestly, like I, you, like I, I dropped my jaw so many times. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's weird because your book is one of those that, um, if, if, if you're not having violent thoughts necessarily when you start the book, um, how do I say this? That like the state attorneys and the prosecutor in your story, I just feel they don't bring out the best in me. You know what I mean? Like I just I I I I don't know how you kept it together and not punch him. Like you know, they oh I mean quite a few of those characters. They're just the it was just the the dishonesty of the whole thing. Um, but I think definitely I'm I, I'm gonna let people read it, but. There's definitely a, one character. Absolutely. He's definitely, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I would say he's, I mean, from my <laughs> humble opinion, he's definitely in the dark triad. I mean, for sure, a narcissist, if not a sadist. I mean, there's quite a few things that I can think of. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, a complete. Well, and that was the problem. Disgrace. They gave it, you know, after. <laughs> You know, the DNA proved they weren't my hairs. I went mm. into actual innocence. They literally gave it back to the same guy it's crazy. That, that we just caught covering it up. And now mm. it's his decision what happens next. And he was threatening us. And, you know, I mean, he was so bold. He put it in writing to my attorneys, mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't have anything to lose, but what are you going to tell your client when they slap handcuffs on him and take him back to prison? So here's a guy that has the full resources of the state financially, whatever. He has the full resources just to, you know, unleash heaven and hell on me. And, you know, luckily for me, I had a great law firm, Roops and Gray, that had been shepherding this case for now almost whatever, over 36 years. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it for free because I would have never been able to afford this. Um, and they, they have vast resources of their own. They're not a little kid on the block to be pushed around. So without them, you know, I would have disappeared into the annals of time. You know, oh, I would sure. have been a blip on nobody's radar screen. 
Yeah. So that's why I had to take the deal because I was up against a corrupt system. The odds are that I would have been convicted again and sent back to prison. And, you know, that wasn't the end result I wanted. And so, you know, I had to sell my soul, take that deal. And that's where the book ended. <laughs> yeah. But um, for those who don't know your full story, was the actual culprit of those murders ever caught and sentenced? Well, the, the guy that accused me, the co-defendant in this mm. case, um, did get sentenced, did do um, 27 years, some, somewhere in that range. Um, he, he did do a life sentence. And then that same prosecutor, you know, went to court for him and got him released. So, you know, and there, and we're aware of several meetings and conversations that were had. And there's some paperwork trail to indicate that there might have been, you know, some kind of deal in the background all along. I mean, he, he, he served a significant amount of time, but not like mine. <laughs> yeah. It's a, you know, it's, um, you, you must be, you, I mean, you must have got something that he thinks, you know, like, how do I say this? Like when, you know, dogs only bark when you're moving. Do you know that? Do you know that expression? I haven't heard that one. Ah, yeah. So dogs only bark when you're moving. That's, it's an expression, it's an expression to say that, you know, people are after you trying to scare you doing things, intimidating you because you're making moves because you are all, and it's not in a negative way, but it's like you are actually get going somewhere. You have something in you and they don't like it. So they start barking. Um, that's, that's how, and you know, and they're called dogs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, okay. I got you. Yeah. There may be something obviously that, you know, he, you have oh. maybe something that he wants or he's somehow you rubbed him a certain way. I think um, that's true. Mm. And I think his career trajectory, got associated with my case mm -hmm. when my case started he was an assistant prosecutor on the case and you know it was a very high profile case it was a double death penalty case and it's a small county they don't have too many of those type of cases and he kind of used that as a springboard after the case to run against his boss and succeeded in winning you know and became the state's attorney and then I had won a new trial within a year of the first trial. They threw the whole thing out. We started over and he prosecuted me again, got the conviction. So I think there was an association to, you know, almost the ego, the win loss and, and making sure that, you know, this first big case of his did not get reversed, you know? So I, I don't, I, you know, I, I get asked that question. I don't have an answer. I'm not a psychologist, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I don't want to get into his head, honestly, no. like you said, there's a dark side there. I don't want to get lost in that. So no. whatever he is, he is, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And you've got better things now. Um, so, so because, you know, there's a, there's sort of a, I want to go into a little bit of um, your experience um, inside, um, what happened and, you know, how you coped with it. So you were sentenced to death. If I understand correctly, not all death sentences are sent to supermax prisons. You can go to sort of a different type of prisons. So at the beginning, you were not sent to a supermax. But no, after... they didn't even have those. You know, supermaxes came a little bit later in the 80s. Here in the United States, they started with um, Red Onion in Virginia or West Virginia, Virginia, and then um, Pelican Bay in California. And it was the late eighties that they had built these two. And then all the correctional officers from all the different States went out there and toured it and it just became the new thing. And they started building supermaxes in every state until the feds got involved and said, Hey, these are kind of unconstitutional the way you're treating people. And, you know, so they shut them down, but for a while they were the rage. They just weren't there in the beginning. And for me in Maryland, Maryland's death row was not, segregated or locked down as a death row when i first went into the penitentiary um obviously we were all in the maryland state penitentiary that's where we were housed that's where the gas chamber was which was the means of execution when i was first sentenced um a couple years into it i can't really remember maybe four or five years after i'd been there they did move us all onto one tier still a population regular population tier 
but we just had to be the first, whatever, one through six, one through 12, however many of us were there at the time on death row, we just had to be in those first sections of cells, but it was a regular tier. So like the cell, the tier was 28, 28 cells long. And we, at different points in time, again, depending on how many people on death row, would occupy the first seven, the first 15, whatever it might have been, whatever that number looked like. But we we functioned like any other inmate in general population. You know, we could have jobs. We went to the yard with the other inmates. You know, we just were, you know, there was really nothing to distinguish us from anybody else. Of course, correctional staff knew who we were, but we were allowed to do that. And then it was interesting, literally right around the time I came off within less than a year of that, they came in the middle of the night around midnight and grabbed everybody that was still on death row and took them to supermax. And from that point on, they were in 23 and a half hour day lockdowns. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were kept in supermax. That's, I mean, because when I, when I've read about supermax before, it's, it was for, in Karen County's book, um, her story about Gacy, who was a serial yeah. killer. And he was in Supermax yeah. along with his peers, right? And his peers were, I mean, you know, scary. Weird, and like, right. And that's what the, the Supermaxes were designed to house the worst of the worst. For criminally insane and, and, and the serial killers, um, right. stuff like that. And so when I read that you were sent to Supermax, I was just like, well, after like good behavior for 13 years, you just send there like it it, it seemed like I, I like how she's 17 that even years <laughs> oh 17 years. okay yeah because they sent me in 1999 and it was it was a political move is what it was they mm. raided they raided their own prison there was a, a power play going on about who was going to be the next commissioner and the acting commissioner decided to create this crisis that basically the inmates are running the asylum and so they came in with um, seven to 900 correctional staff in full riot gear. Um, and their goal was to grab one particular inmate, Dennis Wise, and all his so-called henchmen that were running the prison. So they grabbed 50 people and sent us all to Supermax. Out of the 50 people, interestingly enough, I was the only white guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they gave everybody six months coming in the door and gave me a year which turned into a year and a half. So yeah, they just grabbed people that had influence. They were just trying to say we were running the prison and we weren't not in a negative way. Like I was president of the JCs, which was a, you know, community based organization, a nonprofit. Um, and that's leadership development through community service. So we were doing a lot of, you know, very healthy and um, community based projects that yeah. had impact both inside and outside. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to circle back to the work that you did and that you do now as well. Um, I just want to ask you first, like, how did you because you obviously you in a tiny cell, it's dirty mm -hmm. in there, you barely get I mean, you don't really get any nutrition in that time. Um, you isolated for 23 hours a day on a good day in if they don't forget to let you out for an hour in, <laughs> you know, in awful conditions. How did you like, how did you how did you maintain like, how do you maintain hope? Like, how do you keep going? Because you don't have any, like when you're in there, you have zero support system, really. So, and, and you're there, you're not even guilty. You're innocent. Like, how did you, how did you cope? Well, that, and I've read about it in the book. And honestly, I'm not one, especially in prison, we don't show emotion. We don't let you in to our personal thoughts and things like that. You know, you just build up that wall. Mm. And when I wrote the book, you know, I had my publisher and, you know, my girlfriend at the time, everybody was kicking me in the butt saying, you got to put some of you in here. And so I did write about something that was very personal. I'd never spoke about it to anybody. And it was my weakest moment. And I was ashamed of it um, where I was ready to give up. And that was Supermax. Um, when they sent me there, it was such a shock to my system. Like you said, I'd been doing all this positive programming for years and a well-established track record of what I was doing. Um, not getting in any trouble, no infractions, and just, you know, really networking both inside the prison as well as outside community. You know, we, we had a foot in each, in each lane. 
and you know they snatch you up they send everything you you know you own home so you basically are going to have to start over anyway and i was just bewildered i was like in shock by it and i let it get me i let it get me so down that i was like well, why the fuck should i care mm. you know you know like and i was you know i started having this conversation with my mother in my head and i was just apologizing and saying i, I can't do it anymore i'm done you know, and I'm looking around the cell, like, how would I end it? You know, I'm I'm really having those kind of thoughts. And, you know, I don't even know if I had the courage because, you know, people that take their own life and stuff, that, that takes a lot of heart. It takes a lot yeah. of courage. Yeah, it does. And I don't know that I had it, but I was really thinking about it. And, you know, and I'm having this you know conversation with my mom and, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm leaking a little bit. I'm shedding a tear here and there. And all of a sudden my cell door opened. And I hear shakedown, you know, there's officers standing there to, you know, come in and search my cell. So, you know, of course I got to brush my face off real quick and, you know, I come to the door so they can handcuff me. And behind those two officers is this little sergeant who I knew from back in the penitentiary, you know, he had actually got promoted and transferred over to Supermax and he's just sitting there grinning. So I step out and he's like, I heard you were here. I just wanted to come by and say hi. And I was like, you know, you motherfucker, you know, but it, it the, you know, I took it as a sign, you know, like mm -hmm. that was my, you know, my mother sending me a sign, like, nope, it's not your time, you know, get that thought out your head. Like it was just so much interruption, you know, boom, right in that second. And I never thought like that again. And from that moment on, I went back to sort of being my own self. Like mm. I'm not going to let them beat me. I am not going to, you know, become the person they want me to become. And that's, that's, that was my strength. Cause in the beginning, after my second trial, I was kind of like, you know, I became a little bit angry. Let's just put it that way. And I, and I was getting in trouble. You know, I got in some fights. I was, especially with the, the correctional staff, like I did not like them putting their hands on me. Yeah. So I had, I had a couple of street charges for fighting them. Um, I had an attempt to escape. I was just not living right until finally I woke up and said, I'm becoming everything they want me to become. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for them to point to me and say, look at that guy. He, you know, he's always getting in trouble, or, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's a guilty dude. He's, you know, Charlie Manson, whatever. He's the boogeyman. And I said, no, I'm not going to let him do that. You know, I'm not going to let him make me into something I'm not. Mm -hmm. And so I just came back from that and just, you know, I guess, became stronger. It's a Nietzsche thing, you know, that, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, there's actually, there's a, there's a, another quote from Nietzsche in your book that it says, um, he who has a why to live can bear almost anyhow. And that seemed to really resonate with you. Well, you know, I had my why, you know, yeah. I had, it was bigger than me, you know, once you know, look, I'm an 18, you know, I think I'm smart. I think I'm mature. Mm -hmm. I was 18 years old. Yeah. Let's be real. How smart, yeah. how mature was I? But I grew up and luckily for me, you know, I grew up in the right way. And I had, I already had, you know, I had great parents that exposed me to a lot of things and, you know, developed my social conscience when I was young. I just didn't realize it, you know, until years later. And um, so I fell back on that and I, it gave me the strength and I guess the direction to, to go. And I was reading, I was reading a book one time and at the front, you know, you get these little quotes or excerpts and mm -hmm. the quote was um, about the dash, which is a very famous poem, but I didn't know it at the time, but it just said at the end of time, most men are relegated to a tombstone on that tombstone are two dates. This person was born. This person died in between is a dash, but few ask why. And it resonated with me. And I had my mother in my ear saying, you must be there for a reason, figure it out. So I had that in my ear. And then I'm reading this and I'm like, you know what? Whatever happens, like if they end up executing me, guess what? I'll walk into that gas chamber, head hell high. You know, I'm not going to be fighting and struggling. I'm going to leave them with doubt because I'm going to live an upright life. I'm going to have a life that's impactful. I'm going to create a dash, even in these circumstances, I'm having a dash because at the end of the day, that's what life's about. Yeah. Regardless of who you are. We we do that through our children. We do that through 
our work, we do that through our interactions in the community or in our religious you know, facilities, whatever. Mm-hmm. We leave a dash. That's all you can leave, you know, unless you're Rockefeller or something, they name buildings after you and they're not going to last forever either. But you leave your impact on others. And so that's what I just I said, I'm going to do it. I mean, and, I knew we really did it because I... Well, I leave that for others. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about like because you did so much work um, you know, when you were in prison, you started so many initiatives, you left a big, big impact. Um, and you continue the work as well now. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about so, like some of the work that you did in prison and why you felt that was important to do and why you still feel it's important? You know, a friend of mine was involved with the JCs. We worked together in the package room and he was always doing paperwork and stuff like that. So for those that don't know, the JCs is the junior chamber of commerce. And, you know, back in the day before the internet, when you had these social civic community groups, they were one of the biggest. Um, And they teach leadership development through community service, meaning they do community projects. And then by running those projects, you learn how to manage personnel, you learn how to manage a budget, you learn how to, you know, have impact, all those kind of things. And it's a great program. So I got involved with that. And like instantly, they brought me on the board of directors, I was their ways and means director. And then two years later, I was the president. And I'd be, you know, a state president for probably the next 10, 12 years on and off. Um, You're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be one term only, but apparently I was good at it. Mm -hmm. But when I became president, I felt a responsibility. Um, we had a lot of younger, you know, inmates in population. And, you know, of course I'm young, but there were 16, 17 year old kids in there that had been waived to adult status. And, that's, you know, that's again, insane to me that you mentioned yeah. teenagers. I mean, that I can't believe they're in that, they're in that prison. I mean, oh, absolutely. How, how they do that to, to young people in the, in yeah. the U S is, I mean, yeah. It's well, crazy. yeah, we have nothing to be proud of when it comes to the judicial mm. and correctional system over here. Mm. But, um, yeah, you know, I looked around and, you know, I was like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like these kids would get these murder charges, or whatever, life sentence, and then they were a throwaway group of people. Like the warden back in those days basically only had two rules, you know, don't jump on the wall and don't jump on my officers. Other than that, anything went. You know, my first day in population, I come around the corner by the laundry. Guy was getting two guys were stabbing a guy, and they killed him. Um, I turned to walked away because I'm not going to be a witness to anything. And I'm thinking, oh, we're going to be locked down forever. No, we were locked down for maybe two hours. They threw sand over that blood, opened the yard back up like nothing had happened. Mm-hmm. So I say that just to say that was the value of life. Yeah. And you got these young kids, and they're just running wild, no direction. And I just saw you know, a niche, a lane that maybe I could have some impact. So I got involved in the JCs. I took that very seriously when they elected me. Cause again, I'm the minority, you know, and I had to run for election. It's like 115 guys in that group and I won. So the fact that they entrusted that to me, like I took that to heart. And mm-hmm. so I felt like I had to deliver. So I started creating programs and, you know, we really encouraged the guys at that point, like, go get your GDs. And back then we had the college program. So let's get GDs. Let's go to the college programs, take advantage of educational opportunities. And while you're doing that, you know, we're going to create all these community based opportunities too to interact with the outside community. Cause they would come in the outside JCs came in. I built quite a network all over the state because of that, but it was, you know, it was a la- lot, you were allowed to be human, you know? And, and I think, the guys gravitated to that. Like my successes, if we want to call it that, and I, I'm not the guy to ask about that. Um, but whatever success people think I had, it's because of those guys. It's because they trusted me. They followed my leadership. They allowed me to accomplish whatever we ended up accomplishing. Mm -hmm. Like I just didn't take no for an answer. I would go to the administration with the most outlandish thing because I thought it was a good idea. And what was the, what was I would the most push outlandish? it. What was the most outlandish thing? That you- um, probably, I guess maybe the family day because, you know, our, our visitation was structured that when kids come in, you know, you've seen it in every prison movie, there's a barrier. 
Yeah. You know, and it's hard to tell a four year old or young child, like you can't hug dad. Like you can only hug him for a minute at the beginning and the end of the visit. So the family day basically created an environment where it was, first of all, a four hour visit compared to maybe an hour in the visiting room. And it was a full contact visit. And we started them around the Christmas holiday. So we added all these ingredients. I was very fortunate. I had my, my other JC chapters around the state. We got involved with the Angel Tree um, program from Prison Fellowship. So, like, we had gifts, you know, wrapped ups for the kids to get. They could pick out their own gift and then take it downstairs and open it in front of their father and the whole family unit and then play with toys. And we had a cotton candy stand and a button making stand and, you know, hot dog station, you know, just all of this normal stuff in a very abnormal environment. <laughs> Yeah. But for that four hours, you were allowed to be human. You were allowed to be a family unit and interact in that way and just have fun. And those kids didn't necessarily feel the atmosphere of, you know, visiting room of a prison, which is cold and stale, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think I wouldn't call it outlandish, but that was probably my biggest footnote, you know? And then there were others, like when we did our video project, you know, first they approved it and then they said no, because there was a riot and, and they were just feeling, you know, some kind of way because there'd been a riot and they didn't feel appropriate that we make this video because they thought we were going to glamorize inmates. So the video I'm speaking of, we, you know, we have these different scared straight kind of programs where kids would come into the prison, yeah. but there's so many that can't come in. So I teamed up with a local news anchor. And the thought was, we're going to make a video that we can put out in the school system that would have our younger inmates speaking to their peers about peer pressure, about the importance of school and education and staying away from drugs and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And it took me, I, I'm out of this huge political campaign because they said, no, we're not going to let you do it. And I just wrote letter after letter after letter. Finally, I guess they got tired of me and they let us do it. So <laughs> I don't know. I just wouldn't take no for an answer. Yeah, yeah, but it sounds like I mean I'm I'm hearing like three main themes like you know like if you want you know individuals in prison to you know because obviously there are there are other inmates who were rightly convicted right not everyone would have been wrongly absolutely. convicted yeah, there's no, absolutely there's a spectrum there's a spectrum of crimes and in the US I mean from a, a you from someone who's from Europe. Um, and half Danish, like in Denmark, when we look at the US, I mean, not the whole country, but just people around me, I know that we look at the, the sentencing and we, we find it extremely harsh. Um, and in other countries, it's not harsh enough. Uh, you know what I mean? So there's like, obviously, right. there's work to be done everywhere. But I think what I what I'm hearing is like, if we want, you know, let, let's, let's, let's say like, you know, for people who are, let's say, who are guilty, you know, were actually guilty of, of crimes if we want them to 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 be to be to look at life differently or to to have to have some sort of redemption to to have a life with meaning which in turn will actually help them be of of service in society right you there's three things i sort of hear from you is like one is like humanizing them like you humanize them you know with the with the the Christmas day, you know, the family day, sorry. Um, and also when you give people room to step up, like you were given room to step up, you know, you got, you had responsibilities, you were, you were kept busy. All of those things gave you skills. It sounds like it keeps you out of, you know, sort of like spiraling down in your head. And it also gives you skill for when you do eventually come out because sentences are not all for life. And so people right. do come out and then, you know, what do you do if you, we cannot expect as a society to have people locked up in a in a cement box and doing nothing because we think we can't invest money into it because you know it's taxpayers money but then when they do come out what do they do what do they expect them to do we need to you know give a better chance to people and um, because also the reason why they're there in the first place you know Unless it's something you do, they, they were born a certain way. I don't know, you know, um, like you know, psychopath or born, sociopath or made. So you know, uh, if we, but everyone else, there's a whole spectrum of other reason why people are in prison. So 
the usually the way I see it is like usually when people have are in the system, we've already let them down. Like as a society, there were Absolutely. things that happened, right? Exactly, like a chain of decisions that happened that led them there. Um, and we call it the school to prison pipeline over here. Oh, can you tell us about more about that? Well, it's just the failure, you know, of you know positive role models, you know, socioeconomic situations. Yeah. Even our, you know, unfortunately, you know, our inner city school systems, you know, can be failing too. You know, we're just not we're just not putting the work in, and then we're we're reaping what we sow um, because we're churning out, you know, people that don't have a, a sound moral balance or a sense of right and wrong and ethics and things like that. And of course, they're gonna you know, socioeconomic situation, yes. it, it breeds crime. And, you know, and as you say, you know, the penitentiaries, you know, just the word alone, it, it's penance. It yeah. came from the Quakers, time out, let's put them on the side, make them think about it. You know, but here, especially in the United States, it's become such a society of retribution and, you know, eye for an eye. And we're just, mm -hmm. you know, we have the largest prison country, prison population in the world. You know, and yeah, we no, do it, the longest amount of time, and we have nothing to be proud of in that regard. Nothing. No, and, and then they call themselves the was it the land of the free? Yeah, yeah it's it's ridiculous, yeah. and it's yeah. you know it's Jim Crow, it's segregate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole yeah. It's you know we see that with the crack cocaine epidemic, and even the marijuana. You know, our governor just literally pardoned. I don't even know how many it was like a thousand people with marijuana charges. But how many of those people lost jobs and opportunity because they had a record or? actually did time in jail or prison because of stuff that's now legal. Yeah. Like, you know, we just can't seem to get certain things right. Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to wrongful convictions, we just don't want to admit when we made a mistake. It's ridiculous. It is shocking. It's shocking. I mean, and it happens here too. Um, right. Oh yeah. I'm from here. I've, I've had dealings with your London Innocence Project. You've had the wheeze on your show. So yeah, yeah. yeah. They've got yeah. their work cut out for them over there too. I'm aware. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's it's really difficult situation once you wrongly fully convicted, and and it happens to literally it can happen to anyone. Like, Absolutely. you know, there's obviously like vulnerable populations, and depending where you live and things like that as well, will have a factor of how targeted you may be. But it can literally happen to anyone, really, like anyone. I mean, that talk with Louise, like, like really did scare me. Um, it, you have to really, really think about how how knowledgeable you think you are when it comes to the legal system, when you get arrested, like what are the things you need to do? And I think right. obviously it was a different time in your day, but I think the, the, the philosophy is still the same is that if you don't have a good legal team, if you don't have the finances to pay for a half decent lawyer, you're pretty much screwed if 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 you're arrested and the police just wants to you know to convict you or to you know have those charges go through or whatever the wording is what the legal word is but you really really need to be like so informed and um absolutely i need to actually to brush up on it i need to <laughs> check again what louise told me um but yeah it is really really dangerous and i think maybe also with this whole sentencing in the us and, and around the world as well but we're talking about the us now is I understand that when something extremely, extremely violent and disturbing happens, you want that person to be put away. You don't want them as a neighbor. But this is the thing. Not everybody. But you want the right person put away. <laughs> That's there the key. You go. That's the thing. Because <laughs> in the meantime, the guilty one is still walking out. And also, not everybody is a dumb, um, what's it called? A Bundy, a Dama, you know, a BTK. Right. You know, I mean, BTK is in lockdown. You know, he's in lockdown 24 I mean, you know, and for good reason. <laughs> For good reasons. Um, you know who I mean by BTK? No, I don't know. Oh, wait a uh, he's full, so the, he's the um, bind, torture, kill. He's a psychopath, right. a serial killer. No, uh, yeah, psychopath. He was born, born, and then he got activated uh, from a young age. But yeah, I mean, he's he will never be redeemed, um, and he loves everything that he did. Um, so it's that's a very different type of monster. It is. That someone who gets in the wrong situation makes some wrong decisions and then can get redemption right can sort of look at it in a different way and so mm, so 
so obviously this is work also that you carry on doing but i have i have a question actually something that sort of bugged me in your book <laughs> because obviously uh, in the us inmates they work you know you can work and then you get a wage but i wanted to ask you what your thoughts were about companies paying inmates now at the time when you were incarcerated maybe it's different now but at the time between $30 to $150 a month, right, for work rendered. Now, $150 is very, very low, even when the inmates called it lawyer money because he afforded you to eventually save for a lawyer, mm -hmm. obviously not the most expensive lawyer because it's still not <laughs> enough money. Is the no. prison, I mean, is it, to me, it feels like, it feels like the system or companies taking advantage of the prisoners is it the prison taking a big cut or is it companies exploiting inmates or is there another way of looking at this that I'm not seeing? Well, okay. In Maryland, I can speak to that. Um, we have what they call MCE, Maryland Correctional Enterprises, and they run, you know, the prison industry plants. Um, and that ranges from furniture to a meat factory, to license plates, to signs, to, um, stationary, uh, any kind of printing material, all those kind of things. So putting that in perspective, they are what's called um, an independent state agency, self-funded. So they're like our Maryland lottery. The lottery is the only other state agency that funds itself because they have so, you know, so much revenue. MCE's revenues, and I don't know what they are this year, but last time I was aware, they, it was $53 million a year. Wow. $53 million a year is what they bring in. And as you point out, you know, top pay, you might make 150, less than $200 a month. Um, I spent whatever, 17, 18 years working in a license plate factory, what they call it the tag plant, where all the license plates in Maryland come from. Um, and I made about between 125 and 150. In my last eight or nine years, I switched over and went to work for the sign plant where I did like our main airport, BWI. I did both of our stadiums, Canyon Yards and M&T Stadiums for the Baltimore Orioles and the Baltimore Ravens, all of our national park services, the Maryland Zoo. You know, these were our customers. Um, there, when I was there, we were getting our added incentive was 4% of sales. So, you know, we could make 200 maybe 300 if we had a great month but again not necessarily you know measurable to anything you know it's better than working inside the prison where you're going to get 30 dollars a day to clean the tier or work in the kitchen or you know something like that um and that's why we call it lawyer money because it's significantly better than the inside job um i don't know i think that had i like the idea, the concept of MCE, because it was job training mm -hmm. and it was transferable, meaning there were certain parts of it that will transfer out here into the real world. Um, yeah. Not so much making license plates, but working in an assembly line, you know, working with other people, working in a construct, you know, constructive environment where you have to be at work at a certain time, you work till a certain time you know, yeah. production demands. There's a lot of those soft skills that wrap around it because obviously when I came home, my lane became re-entry and I ran the largest, you know, community-based re-entry program in Baltimore City. And I found through that work that men and women who had been exposed to MCE assimilated quicker and probably more successfully than those that had not because they had been in a structured work environment when they were in prison mm -hmm. and it was easier for them to adjust to that out here. So there's advantages. Yeah. Should it be paid more? I, yeah, absolutely. But I don't know how that, you know, works. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing that that's the thing as well, that it, it because it, you know, like you actually also, like, you know, like you say in your book, it actually gave you, it's like a kickstart to your resume when you come out and you have all that experience and it actually gave right. you some opportunities, right? So it's sort of like, a, it's like there's two sides to that coin, right? It's like, you know, is it a little bit exploitative? But at the same Absolutely. time, <laughs> I got pips. <laughs> yeah, at the same time, it gave you like that trampoline when you came out. 
But you mentioned about those inside the jobs inside the prison, like cleaning the toilets, the floor. Was that you say thirty dollars a day? Because then that would be more than no, thirty dollars a month. Oh Christ! And those toilets yeah. cannot be nice. I mean, the toilets no. at work in my office are disgusting. It's like it's like a festival every Monday morning. I don't know how they. I can speak to the cleaner in there every time. I'm like, I'm so sorry if our people leave the toilets in here. It's disgusting. Um, but the prison, I can't imagine. Is like you know. Like that cannot be, that cannot be fun. Um, yeah, it's, um, what was I, um, gonna say like, cause I, I, I want to get into like the work that you do about re and stuff, but just want to quickly just round up the life inside. When you, when you in a prison, like the prisons that you were in, is it, is it dangerous to claim your innocence when you're surrounded by like legit dangerous, dangerous criminals? Like, how does the prison population at large view that when you claim your innocence? I mean, first of all, none of us, I didn't, no, nobody walks around and talks about their case. You know, it's mm -hmm. just not something you do anyway. You don't want people in your business. Um, so, but the one thing about convicts is they're the best people readers in the world. And first of all, they already know who you are before you walk in the door. They knew who you were when you were in the county jail, you know, the feeder system. They, they're they so, their grapevine is so good. And they are so up to date. Like they read the paper, they watch the news, so they know your case. They already know. Wow. And then it doesn't take long, you know, especially when you read people. And, and that's a skill I think we all develop in that environment because mm -hmm. you have to know who's a threat, who's not a threat. You know, you, you got to be able to read a room or the yard really quick. And, and smell tension in the air, or, you know, something going to kick off or whatever. Um, so I think for the most part, you, we know like, oh, this guy just doesn't belong, you know, like he doesn't fit it, you know. Yeah. Now, you know, I'm not an innocent person by any means in the sense that, you know, I have a history. I was, you know, involved in drug dealing, you know, I was involved in that lifestyle. So, you know, there's a part of me that's, you know, we would say, you know, I have a street cred, I have a street mm -hmm. background yeah. and that translates as well. And even in prison, you know, prison is the currency of prison is violence, period. So it doesn't matter if you have two death penalties, you have five life sentences or you got 30 years, you know, you better be able to represent for yourself because at some point in time, that's going to be tested. Um, you may get lucky and it, you go, go unscathed and it never be tested, but odds are it's going to be tested. And when it is, you have to show what you're about. And so, it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're guilty, your innocence. Um, unfortunately, you know, we all have the beast within us and yeah. the, the will to survive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said earlier, you know, for me, when I got angry after my second trial, that's when my beast came out too much. And you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? I, and I saw myself sliding into the world they wanted me to slide into. But also at the same time, it was certainly establishing who I was in there, you know? Yes, yeah. So, sure. you know, I reined it in and I chose to sort of model a different image, you know, because I had already earned my respect. I was able with others, not just by myself, but with others, prove there was another path, like show that, you know what, you could do this positive things. You can go to school and you can get involved in programming and it doesn't make you a punk. It doesn't make you a chump. It doesn't make you vulnerable. You know, we're doing that and we are already strong, you know? So we were able to model something different. Yeah. And, you know, instead of the, you know, the gangs out there recruiting, you know, we could recruit and say, here, here's a pathway to this, that's not a gang. It's not going to make you cannon fodder to be an idiot, you know, and get in trouble. So I think mm -hmm. that that was part of it. Like, you know, you have to have strength. I saw some meme on Facebook the other day. I can't remember what it was, but it says something about a warrior. You know, if you don't have the potential for violence, you yeah. don't have anything to represent. Yeah, but it's just it's, like a knight in yeah, shining armor is not think, what you want. <laughs> I think it's a. I think it's a. There's a quote. Uh, what's his name? Jordan Peterson mentions about how um, weak. Hang on, something to do with weak men and dangerous men. Um, it's something to say like if you are. Oh, if you are a harmless man. Oh, do you know what? I'm gonna have to because this. It's actually it relates to what you said. Hang on, let me just find it. 
Harmless man, not dangerous, no. Uh huh. Let me just find it. Um, Literally just saw this the other day. Caught my eye. Let me just see. Oh, there you go. A harmless man is not a good man. Let me just find it. Um, so I don't butcher it. Oh, for God's sake, where's it not? Ah. Oh. A harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a very, very dangerous man who has that under voluntary control. That's true. Yeah. And if I mean, is... you don't want to knight in shining armor because he's never been to battle. <laughs> yeah, you want to knight this guy, his armor, a little nicked up. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And it's like, there's a, when it says, um, and within that, there's also another quote that says, and if you think tough men are dangerous, wait until you see what weak men are capable of. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that's true. It takes a lot of strength to to take the, the high road to say, I'm not going to be who they expect me to be and take and go down that slippery slide because no one's going to stop you on the way down. No, they're all going to be like, they'll be cheering for you. They'll encourage Absolutely. you to carry on, right? They'll love it. It's encouraged. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely encouraged, yeah. So it's definitely more of the uphill battle. And that's probably when you know you're on the right path because it's, it builds character and, and it's, it's a dangerous path to, to go because I'm sure it did rub other people the wrong way. You becoming something, someone, um, that they did not have the resilience to be. Um so that, you know, I would imagine that's, um, that's something that's not necessarily the safest route um, for a while. Um, I want to ask you, did prison life give you, like I'm hearing obviously there's the knowing how to read the room, reading a situation, which is super important in life. Did, was there any other useful life skills that prison life gave you? outside of these programs that you run, but just pure prison life. You know, it's funny. I've had this conversation. I, I said my next book I should write on prison culture because society mm -hmm. could learn a lot. So prison, you know, has its own rules, I guess you could say, obviously. And, you know, it's a combat zone. It's the jungle, whatever, however you want to describe it. But it has its hierarchy and it has a structure and it has its rules. And, you know, kids today I hear always talk about respect and being disrespected, things like that. And they don't even, they don't understand what respect is because, no. you know, I, that was part of the things I had to do for myself. And as running a reentry program, you know, I call it sanding off the rough edges when people come home because we are instinctively programmed to react to certain things. Like if you walk past me and bump me with your shoulder and don't excuse yourself, then mm. that's you know, in prison, that's just not good. No. You know, like that's instant or simple. Something, this is something that people don't even think about. You're sitting at the table, you're having dinner and you reach across somebody's food to get the salt and pepper. You would never do that in prison. Do not reach across somebody's food. You yeah. would ask I mean, it, it them is, to it pass is annoying. It. Even I don't like it. I'm like, why are you putting all your germs over here? Like keep it. Right. To just eat. <laughs> You know, just the <laughs> fact of them putting their arm across your food and dirt coming off their sleeve, whatever. Yeah, yeah, These exactly. are little things. So, mm -hmm. you know, men and women, you know, we kind of follow the same rules. You know, in prison are very aware of being, respect, you know, giving respect because the consequences of disrespect could be your life. And it's things people do out here and especially, you know, as I came out and got into the workforce and, you know, corporate culture and things like that. If, it's funny to watch people, they hide behind society, they hide behind corporate structures to do dirty things to each other. Oh, yeah. That yeah. you would get punished for. There would be no hiding. You know, once you, if you were to do those kind of nefarious backstabbing acts, there is no hiding. You, yeah. you will pay the consequence for that. So it's little things like that. If, you know, sometimes I feel like it's society at large to learn how to show and give respect, mm -hmm. they would find they would get it back in return, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's just those little things sometimes that don't seem to be on people's radar screen, you know, that yeah. would just make us communicate better, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. C can you tell us about the, um, the re-entry programs? Cause I think this is really important because I want to talk about breaking the cycle. And you're talking about the school to, was it school to prison? School to prison pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also talk about 
in your book, the circle with the three arcs. I think that comes under like, you know, the philosophy for your reentry programs, breaking the cycle, and you, you sort of, you specialize in that third arc. But would you mind just I, telling us about that circle? Well, I, I don't know if I created it or whatever, but in my mind, you know, when we talk about, you know, our mass incarceration and, you know, criminal justice system here, there are, there are three arcs to the circle in the, you know, we have the front end, which is prevention, which is intervention, which is working with at risk youth. Um, it got popular, I guess, back in the eighties with Nancy Reagan and just say no program, those kind of things. Um, and I think it's still important. I think like you pointed out, you know, we, we reap what we sow here if we're not providing opportunity and diversion from the beginning. We're just creating, you know, a prison population. So there are folk that should be in that lane and are in that lane. That's a very popular lane. Then the middle part of the circle of the arc is the incarceration. You know, here we've got whatever, 2.4 million people in our prisons in, in the United States. And what are we doing with them? 75% of them are going to come home at some point in time. And as you said earlier, like, what kind of shape are they coming home in? They're going to be your neighbor, my neighbor. Yeah. What are we doing to prepare them to be successful when they get home? So they don't recivitate, meaning reoffend and go back in, creating even more problems. We don't do much. You know, we warehouse. It's all about you know, eye for eyes, retribution. We don't care. Um, there's very few really positive programming or outside agencies or groups that are, go in there and work with that population. Um, so it's just wasted time. And it, it's, it doesn't cost that much to do anything. You know, like we're spending, what, $45,000 a year to incarcerate somebody. You know, we could spend $1,000 a year just throw some extra programs in there. You know, keep the educational opportunities going. There's only two, two proven statistics that reduce recidivism, and that's job training and education. Yeah. So we just need to emphasize those. And then the third and final part of the arc is, okay, we've already failed at the front end. We may have failed at the middle part. Now they're coming home. What do you do with them in reentry? Because they are coming home and they're coming home in way more numbers than the organizations that are out here are equipped to deal with. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are going to fall through those cracks. So, you know, people hear my story and like you said, they get angry or whatever. And I always just say, Hey, Find your place. You know, if you're going to get angry, then make a difference. Get involved. And it's not for me to say what's your lane. You know your jobs. You know you know your skill set. You know what you like to do, where you feel you can contribute. Just find one of those arcs and get involved and make a difference. What was for you, like, what was the the biggest challenge for you when you re-entered? You know, and given <laughs> already you had so much, you'd done so much work. I mean, you build a resume that most people on the outside don't even have. Because you really kept you you really went for it. You made the most. But what was for you the, the hardest bit about reentry? I think everybody thinking I didn't need help. <laughs> it was interesting because you know, I hit the ground running, you know, because I didn't know how much time I had. I was facing another trial. They could have sent me back tomorrow. I was on bail. They could have revoked my bail. I didn't know how much time I had. So I took the approach again, you know try to strengthen my dash a little bit. I, you know, I was, this is my mindset. I'm so ornery like this. I'm like, well, they're going to know I was there. You know, I'm going to hit that town. I'm going to, I'm going to do something that they're going to know I was there. So I just burnt the candle at both ends. But interestingly enough, you know, as I sort of progressed in my career journey, I was working at living classrooms and they had a they had a, an individual that was assigned to um, his job was to connect everybody in the program with a mentor so that that person would have a mentor that could help guide them in addition to the case management team, things like that. So, you know, one day I, my desk was right next to him. One day I looked over at him and I said, Ralph, how come you never assigned me a mentor? And he looked at me, he was puzzled. He really was puzzled for a minute. And he just looked at me and said, I didn't really think you needed one. And I was like, well, there's a 32 year gap in my resume. I'm out here just on my own trying to figure this shit out, you know, like, yeah, maybe I could have used a mentor. And then he, he tried to, he was going to assign me this kid that had just come back, moved back from California. 
And because he had a graphic arts background, and so did I, he thought it'd be great. But I'm like, this kid was looking for a job and he was like 30 something and I'm like 50. And I'm like, yeah, who's going to be mentoring who here? So I didn't take it. Yeah. But, you know, it was just one of those things that really, because I wasn't going to let him see me sweat. Nobody, you know, like I came out, I presented as confident. I quietly just put my work in. Other people noticed it and that created opportunity. Um, but I never exposed that. Yeah, I went home every night. I never went to the bars. I didn't do any of that. I went and sat on my stoop. I watched the sunset or I went and sat in the park and people watched and I went to bed and I got up and did it all over again. And I was working 60 hour weeks and just busting my ass. And I just didn't want anybody to know that I knew what the fuck I was doing. You know, like I really was lost. Um, you know, I had nobody to sort of mentor me and take me up a career line. Um, I just got, I started to say lucky and people remind me, don't say lucky. So I got blessed that other people noticed the work and gave me opportunity. Now you think about that. I'm on bail facing another double murder trial. And I get an offer to apply for the position that had just opened up director of workforce development for the largest nonprofit in Baltimore. You know, so in that role, you know, not only is it good money, obviously, but, you know, I have a direct staff of 25. I have three buildings under my portfolio to manage and I'm serving a thousand people a year and I'm developing a bigger program that we are, we were implementing throughout East Baltimore. And they wanted me to do that while I'm on bail. While I have a banana, you know, peel under my foot, they said, nope, you're the right one for us. So yeah. again, it's like being elected president of the JCs. With that comes a lot of responsibility and you you have to repay people's faith. You know, same way when I came home, you know, my lawyer to my bail sponsor, I called my bail sponsor when I came home and said, you know, do I need to come by? He said, for what? I said, I don't know. You need to take a Polaroid on me or something. He said, I think there's enough pictures of you on the internet. <laughs> I said, I don't, I like, it. he said, are you going to run? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, then go live your best life. Yeah, and that's I, all anybody ever told me is just go live your best life. Yeah, I love that. They don't know the price tag. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> they don't know the price tag that that comes with. Cause now you got a, you got a responsibility to them to actually redeem their faith in you. And yeah. not only, you know, what does that mean living your best life? And my vocabulary meant have an impact and, you know, furthering my dash. So, yeah, I think that seems to be like a theme for you, isn't it? Like to make sure that you make the most of every opportunity so that your life is not wasted because you, 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 you find, you know, you view life as something very sacred and not to Absolutely. be wasted. Mm -hmm. See, I can look at 32 years as 32 lost years. I refuse to look at them as 32 wasted years. There's lessons learned. There was impact, maybe, you know, like I hate, to, I don't like judging impact. I let other people do that. But I knew that the, the comrades that rolled with me and a lot of them are home now and a lot of them are very successful and they're living their best life. And I like to think, you know, because maybe a little bit of my influence or my touch, you know, I had a part in that journey. And that's all I need to know. As long as I can feel that in my heart, I'm good. I don't, I don't like the certificates of the awards. I don't like the pat on the back. You know, I just like to see them on the street and they tell me, Hey, I just bought my first house. So we're having a, you know, our first baby or I got yeah. promoted and you know, it's like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Uh, John, are you okay for time? Cause I know I delayed it with the internet issue. No, I'm fine. You're yeah. fine. Okay. Um, can you, I, I want to ask you about the, actually, before I go into the, avoidance training, the wrongful conviction awareness and avoidance training that, um, that you did with the uh, Illinois police academies. I, do you have any tips for us? Like to how to, like, how did you let go? I, I don't know if she, I don't know if let go is the right word, but you know, that experience could have turned you into a very different person, you know, um, you know, you could, like, how did you, cause you, you have, you seem to have like such a, I'm not saying you don't have bad days, obviously, but you have a very optimistic, uh, very pragmatic way of looking at everything and to not let something keep you down for too long. 
Like, is this something that you innately have or is it something that you worked on? I think maybe a combination. I definitely had to work on it because like, look, I'm human and, you know, especially, you know, I guess my parents would tell you as you're young and, you know, I, you know, I would react. I have a quick temper, um, you know, all those kind of things. Yeah. I think for me, you know, it's one of those, because they took everything, my name, they took everything, you know, you, you just, you hang on to what's left, which is, you know, it's the old Scarface movie. I got it as my word, my balls, I won't break them for anybody. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, you know, you hang on to, I say your real estate, which is your mind. That's your real estate. And when you start renting space to those negative anger, jealousy, bitterness, all that crap, it doesn't serve a purpose. You know, that prosecutor is sitting in his house, sipping a glass of wine right now, reading a book or whatever he's doing. He's not thinking about John Huffington. And he's not sitting there wondering, is John Huffington still mad at me? You know, so why should I let him stay in my head and carry that? You know, like, no, um, I'm not saying it goes away or you forget. I think it's more compartmentalizing it and just putting it away. You know, like, I'm not going to waste time giving him the time of day. I'm not going to think about that. Um, I have, you know, that's what they say. That's why the rear view mirror is small and the windshield's big. You have to look forward. You know, the past is there to learn from. The past is there to give us experience, but the past is not to be lived in yeah. and wallowed in. You got to pick your feet up. You got to move forward. If we're not moving forward, we're not moving. So every day it's one step in front of the other. And yeah. that's kind of how I take it. And I take it with excitement. And I take it with you know, gratitude and my attitude and appreciation that there is another morning and I get to see that because mm -hmm. some point there's not going to be. And yeah. so while I'm still here and I have those opportunities, I lead a pretty cool life and I lead that cool life because I take that approach. You know, I mean, I get asked that when I do talks at these colleges and universities, like, why are you not angry and bitter? It's like, well, here's the easy answer. Would your professor have gone out there on the street, grab this angry, bitter guy to come talk to you today? <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, you know, exactly. like mm -hmm. it's it's a negative and it's detrimental. So you try your best just to compartmentalize it, focus on the positive. You can't have a bad day if you focus on something good that happened that day. Then yeah. every day is a good day. And we'll get over the bad parts. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think also because you're doing so much you very much do like service work, you know, very much in service. You definitely have like, you know, you have a reason to, to your life. Like you, you seem to, like for me, from what I understand, like you have, you know, you definitely have a meaning. You have a, you, you, you're in service really, uh, and you're giving back to society. And this is something that I've learned from my mom. She didn't tell me, she just showed me and pushed me in a different situation that showed me that if you were in a bad spot, obviously not comparing with you because is not right. But I'm just saying is like when you mentally in a bad spot, um, the fastest way to get out of it, other than obviously dealing with it and figuring it out is to actually help other people mm -hmm. and to do something that helps others. Even if you do it for a very selfish reason so that you can get out of the house and think about something else. But eventually it's like, it's like a magic all of a sudden it's, it evaporates and it's not as heavy anymore. And it's, there's not that emotional, charge that's so strong anymore and eventually you start to like see the light a bit more but obviously for you it's on it's on completely other on a complete other level on steroids you know like everything you went through know and what you're that. doing now <laughs> oh yeah no i just sure. I, was, I was just racing the clock because i didn't know how you know i was trying to cram it in everybody else sort of has a lifetime to do it that's the only difference i cram mine in yeah but i think but, gandhi yeah. said something like that you cannot truly help another without helping yourself in return yeah, you mentioned that truth. in your book. It's so true. It's so true. Yes. yes. So <laughs> people so look at me as like, look at this guy. I'm like, no, nah, I'm yes. selfish. <laughs> I'm, yeah. just, I'm out. I'm a vampire. I'm out there just sucking up everybody's energy. I, you know, I thrive off of that. I yeah. benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it does make you feel good. And yeah. it does give you purpose and direction. But, you know, every, you know, it's funny because you started to be a little self-depreciating when you made the comment, not like yours. And I constantly mm -hmm. remind people. It's not about comparing. We all get butt hurt. We all go through tragedy. We all have personal turmoil. There's no scale to put that on. To you, yours is as heavy as mine was. 
you know, it's all about in your approach to it. It's all about in how you decide to take it on. Mm-hmm. You know the difference between buffaloes and cows? No. So when a storm comes, the cows, they run from the storm. And what happens is the storm just hangs over top of them. It takes them forever to get through it. <laughs> buffaloes are a little smarter. Buffaloes put their heads down and go into the storm because they know they're going to come out on the other side quicker. <laughs> so the question in life is, are you a buffalo or are you a cow? Uh, I'm loving the buffalo. I like it too. <laughs> There's no other way to do it. We can't run from our problems. We no. can't run from the issues. They're going to be there. So just go straight forward into it, deal with it. And yeah. trust me, you're going to come out on the other side. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. it's the best method. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, no, I love that. Um, I want to talk about your the avoidance training that you do uh, with the Illinois Police Academies mm-hmm. um, to basically avoid wrongful convictions, right? Can you can you tell us like how, like like how does it work? Like one, how did you how did you get involved with it? And tell us about the key things around that training because I'm really interested in that. Well, I, you know, I was very fortunate. Again, um, the Illinois Innocence Project and the University of Illinois had put together this program, and they've been doing it for a couple of years. Actually, kind of under the radar because they were told not, you know, not to do it. You know, the, originally the police academy frowned their eyes, of, you know, frowned their nose about it. Um, but it, Illinois specifically had a lot of wrongful conviction cases. They had, you know, these group of detectives or whatever they were torturing guys it, it, they just end up with this host of cases and these are you know multi-million dollar settlements so finally illinois woke up a little bit and said okay we're tired of paying this out what can we do so they said well we can be preventive let's you know enhance this program that was already going on there under the radar and make it mandatory so illinois passed a law it's mandatory that every one of their cadets in every single academy including the state police academy has to attend what's called a wrongful conviction awareness and avoidance class. So as this rolled out, I was fortunate enough to be one of the exonerees around the country that got invited. Um, I, I have a lot of friends in the Chicago, Illinois Innocence Project, and several of the exonerees up there are my friends. So they threw my name in the hat, and I got selected to come up there and go through their training so we could do it. Um, it's a PowerPoint presentation that is presented by the University of Illinois and the Illinois Innocence Project. And what they do is they bring in two exonerees to every one of the sessions. And then the exonerees participate by telling their story. They, you know, we take a half hour, 45 minutes each, and we humanize it. But the main goal is to raise awareness and perception about how wrongful convictions occur. Mm -hmm. Um, And usually it's, you know, some police misconduct involved, maybe intentional, maybe not. Um, but again, just to highlight the root causes of wrongful convictions um, and to give pointers and educational opportunity to the cadets on how to avoid that. Um, and it's been really fulfilling for me. I had, um, you know, it's, it, it was weird at first to sit in a room with 100 police cadets in full uniform, mm-hmm. um, but they're very receptive um, and they're very engaging um, in the conversation. And myself and another exoneree did one recently, and one of the cadets came up afterwards and said, you know, I'm going to remember the two of you for the next 20 years of my career. Mm-hmm. And that's all I wanted. You know, what more could you ask for? Yeah. They, you know, they, they, he took it in. He heard it. Um, and he's aware. You know, he he's now has the face to put on it. He's aware of the human, of the humanity of it, the human toll that occurs. And, um, you know, he doesn't want to be that kind of police officer. So what's the, what's one thing that, that you can sort of divulge, like in terms of that can cause a wrongful arrest, like wrongful conviction narrative. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what happens in any case, a narrative begins the minute the first police officer arrives on the scene. Even, you know, cause some of these police officers are like, well, I'm never going to be a detective. I wouldn't be involved. No, you will be. If you're the first officer on the scene and you write down your report, your observations, your notes. So my good friend, Christine Bunch up there, she's the one that kind of brought me into that program. And she was accused of an arson murder of her son. 
And part of the problem in that case was the observations of her when they first got on the scene. Did she cry enough? Did How did she react? Blah, 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 blah. Well, first of all, her son died of smoke inhalation, you know, obviously. And so she had the same because she was in the she was in there and fought to get back in to rescue her son. So you're not taking into account that this person's got carbon dioxide poisoning in their brain, yeah. that they've just lost their child, like yeah. all these kind of things. And you're gonna write the note. Well, she didn't seem like she was that upset. She wasn't crying enough, you know. So those kind of narratives are what snowballs because we take a narrative and then we build evidence around it. So the goal is don't take the narrative, take the evidence and find the narrative. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, you go to the scene and the wife is dead. What's the first narrative? The husband did it, right? Automatic, automatic. It's so easy to go down that slippery slope. And once you go down there, what happens? You put blinders on to real evidence. Like you start ignoring things because it doesn't fit your narrative. But the evidence that you're ignoring points to the true perpetrator who's now going to be running around free until they do it again or DNA catches up to them or whatever. So it's about the narrative. Like don't, don't get confused. Let evidence speak. This is so powerful because it's, it's, I mean, it's like you said, like is the, the narrative is the angle, right? And it's like, absolutely. Gonna, we all gonna, want a story. Yeah. And you're going to have that confirmation bias. You're going to look for things to prove you right. Yep. And, and then from then on your eyes, all your senses aren't this, your eyes are not a camera anymore. They're a projector. What your thoughts are, you're going to look for the evidence of it, right? You can make someone right. wrong for yeah. everything because of the perception that you have. This is so good. What, what, what can do you mind sharing another one? Um, well, part of it is the science too. It's an interesting thing that you know, we've learned so much as science has started to catch up. Like again, arson. Most of the old arson, you know, science they were using, and we can't even call it science, is obsolete, doesn't apply. Um, my case dealt with microscopic hair examination of you know, hair fiber that even the FBI no longer does because now we have DNA. And, you know, that was a huge, huge um, scandal in the FBI lab. My case was involved in that when so many cases were found to have been, you know, lied about, you know, because they think they're experts looking in a microscope and then DNA comes along and tells you, guess what? No, you're not. So I think it's partly be aware of the science um, the available science is out there and always be on the cutting edge of that and utilize those tools to make sure, you know, we're doing it right. Um, you know, so many aspects to everything, but, you know, when you're dealing with cadets, it's more frontline information because obviously prosecutorial misconduct is not going to fall into their world, you know, other than the fact they vote and they have a say in who the prosecutor is going to be. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, yeah, no, this is, um, yeah, no, this is really good. Um, yeah. And I think also there's, there's obviously things like the interview techniques, I think, you know, well, absolutely um, too. Can, yeah, you, know, you can coerce, you can coerce a, a false, well, um, you know, it's interesting. Order. They pass these laws. Now they're not allowed to lie to juveniles. Yeah. Now think about that. Why do they need to pass a law? I know, it's a they're not allowed thing. to lie to juveniles. So, you know, the alternative or the opposite end of that spectrum is, well, you're still allowed to lie to an adult. So they get an adult in an interrogation. They can lie to the adult mm. to to coerce a false confession because that's another huge piece of it too, are false confessions. And people are like, I would never admit to a crime I didn't do. Mm. I have yeah, friends well, that did. Yeah. I have friends that did. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it happens. It's, it's very unfortunate. There's many different reasons why people would. Um, and, yep. and like there's a – it reminds me of this story. Um, now, I – it's, it's a story that actually was my mom who told me about it, so I didn't read it. So maybe I, maybe the, I did not fact check this, but and this obviously is dating a little bit. But it was about how there was this Danish guy. He worked um, in kindergarten or something like that, you know, with children, like as a teacher or teacher assistant. And he got arrested. This was in the US. I think it was in New York. He got arrested. Um, he was accused of, um, you know, um, fiddling with a kid, basically. And he, if, if I remember the story right, he was, you know, he, he was, it was proven that he was innocent, 
but he was the way that they interrogated him he became very very confused and he started to think well maybe i did because the way yeah. they were saying it the way they were saying we've got video footage we've got x amount of testimonies people have seen it you've done it i don't know how else it you know or how they did the interview but basically it made him really doubt himself and it was almost like they were like inserting false memories into his brain and he like gave a false confession like he gave a confession and he was innocent he got so confused um and that became like a big big deal it was a few years ago um he eventually came back to denmark and got you know uh, i don't know how he got this whole case like how he got out of it but you can really like manipulate people you know and i don't know what state of mind he was in either you know i don't know you know also does he have any um you know there may be people who are a bit more vulnerable with regards to like mental health or some things like that you know i don't know and you can really like you can really do some dirty tricks on people and in the meantime like you said the culprit is out there but yeah it's not the first time i hear this that you can give like you can be coerced into giving a confession that you kind of almost like half believe at some point because you're so confused there's a lot of tricks and techniques that they use to do that so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well um yeah it's pretty scary <laughs> um it's like gaslighting at its best so let me see before we go into like the the final thoughts i, I wanted to um ask you if you could give us because i know this is a program that you also worked on on how to de-escalate a situation um when you were in prison and do you have an example like do you have like sort of a template example on how to de-escalate the situation to avoid it turning violent so say if you have someone coming over being confrontational and combative how do you de-escalate that so that was one of the programs i did not create it it's called alternatives to violence project avp it was created created by the quakers uh, like back in the 70s in green haven state prison in new, new york i was one of uh, me and a fellow inmate brought that to the maryland prison system and they operate there now too um but there's different you know we call it transforming powers. Um, and these are things that are already in our, our personal arsenal that we just don't necessarily think about. But, you know, one thing that I always found interesting is just to use humor because it's not expected in those situations, you know? Mm -hmm. Like if you can really quickly just crack a joke, even at your own expense, it, it gives people pause for a minute. And they'll look at you as this MF for crazy. And then, sometimes you can't help but laugh um but yeah there's a lot of different ways to de-escalate it just the thing to remember is that most violence you know it's going up a ladder it's going up steps so be conscious as you're going up the steps mm -hmm. you know because when you get to the top that's where you're teetering is it's, it's very quick to fall you know it's just zero to 100 at that point but actually going up there's always ways to de-escalate it you know thinking from a different perspective, you know, which is the way I try to, you know, make my mind work is always to see a situation from somebody else's lens, you know, like how are they viewing it? Like, why do they feel the way they feel? Or are they just having a bad day? Did they get bad news this morning? What's going on in their world? You know, if you can put yourself in another person's shoes, like, why are they so angry? You know, especially if you're not that angry, you know, like, do I need to catch up to him and be as angry or yeah. figure that, figure this out and bring us both back down, you know, cause sometimes it's funny if you can take the second and think like that and say, what's there so, what's there to be so mad about like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, perspective and, yeah. and other people's perceptions are very important for de-escalations. Yeah. And then find a middle, find always find a win wins because that's important because egos are involved. So you know, find a win-win that allows everybody to feel like they walked away, you know, intact, mm -hmm. you know, without having gave up any bit of, you know, quote unquote, their own manhood, you know, like allow them to save face, so to speak. And, yeah. and, you know, especially as a mediator, if it's not your beef, your argument, if you're able to intercede, because a lot of people, they want that. They want somebody to intercede. You know, they want to stand there, puff their chest up, get all loud, but they also want somebody to be holding them back. Like, yeah, hold yes. me back. 
Absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you know, most people haven't had a, you know, they haven't had a little physical altercation since the schoolyard, and most mm-hmm. never even had that. So as yeah. adults, you know, grown folk, we don't need to do that. Yeah, and people think also like it's all like, oh, you know, you can just, you know, they see fights on TV or whatnot. And the thing is, people don't realize the damage it can cause, you know, when you get punched in the head or if you punch somebody. I mean, it's it's, it's very serious. It's serious. It's not just like I'm six one. If I dropped, if somebody were to catch me good in the jaw and drop me, I'm falling from six feet. My head hits the pavement exactly. and I get brain damaged and die. Guess what? You got a murder charge. That's yeah, how easy it is to happen. And yeah. people just don't think like that. Yeah. So they just look at the movies and don't think through it. Um, mm-hmm. So can, can I just ask you, like, what would you, what's your current job title, John? What do you do now? Um, retired beach bum <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I wouldn't, I don't have a job title. Um, you know, I'm an author. I'm a motivational speaker. Uh, I go around the country. I do college, universities. I've done elementary schools, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And they were they were actually my best audience ever. Oh, um, that's good. I, obviously, you know, as you know, I've been to London twice to do talks over there. I've enjoyed that. Um, so I do that. I do my trainings, you know, when I'm called, you know, two, three, four times a year, maybe I go up to Illinois and do that. Yeah. I do some work with... Um, uh, Kevin Plank and Mag Partners um, of Under Armour, you know, they're building a city on the outskirts of Baltimore. They call it Baltimore Peninsula. And we have events, um, festivals, that kind of thing, music events, other events. And I, I kind of contract. So when they have um, those events, I come in and oversee them on behalf of the property. So we just had like Reggae Rise Up was just there. It was a three day festival. Oh, three to five thousand people a day, all kind of great, you know, bands and music and, you know, beer stations and crafts and all that kind of stuff. It's, it was a fun event. And so I I do that because it's fun to do, yeah. <laughs> but I don't I don't do a, a regular nine to five anymore. Yeah. Can I can I ask you, what's your what's your wish going forward? What's your biggest wish? Do you have any? Um. You know, to continue to just, you know, find find my different lanes where I can have impact. Um, I like to still stay very involved on, you know, the social. I'm still involved with some of the nonprofits that I work with. Um, you know, I'm on a quest for my own personal happiness. I recently moved to the beach, which is why I call myself a retired beach bum now. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, I enjoy, you know, the ocean and the sand and that type of life, more slow paced. Um, just, you know, part of the journey of discovering myself and, you know, I don't know, <laughs> finding my soulmate eventually, you know, just yeah. Yeah. that whole, you know, if that's even meant to be whatever, but, you know, just enjoying life, you know, I, I had a big chunk that's I'm not going to get back and mm-hmm. I have these beautiful opportunities now and I'm, I just want to enjoy them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, of course, of course. Um, I'm going to, uh, first of all, I want to say a big thank you, John, um, for taking the time and, and sharing all of this with us today. Um, I want to I ask the same two questions to all my guests at the end of the the episode um, but for you I've got three so I've just there's an extra one so um, the first one which is the one I don't ask anyone else or not that I remember um, what does freedom mean to you that's a tough one I'm about as you know I'm about to celebrate my freedom day it's the day I came home that's mm-hmm. next weekend um, it means everything uh, until it's you've lost it you don't know what it even is um so freedom to me just means i don't know i can't put it in words it's everything it's it's everything Mm -hmm. and it just it creates gratitude like i'm appreciative of the sun shining over my head i'm appreciative of the sand between my toes leaning against a tree feeling a breeze i'm appreciative of every little thing you know like i don't take anything for granted i'm appreciative of the 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 good friends and the people that i have in my life i'm appreciative appreciative of the opportunities i've been afforded 
to do some pretty cool things and maybe have some impact while I was doing them. And um, yeah, just gratitude in my attitude. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, that's, yeah, no, makes sense. Um, and then the, the other two, the one that I ask everyone is, the first one is, what life lesson do you wish you'd learn sooner? Oh, to listen to my parents. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, we all say, is, you know, we become older. We're like, oh, I'm becoming my parents. Damn skippy you are. and You should be proud of it. <laughs> um, I had, you know, the best parents ever. My mother was so good at really, you know, installing that social conscious at an early age. I did 4-H. I did church youth group. I did Meals on Wheels. I did camp counseling. I did so much of that and just thought they were activities until later in life, I realized, you know, what she was showing me and how we're part of a bigger, you know, fabric here of life and, and how to integrate, you know, my mother was very smart and, you know, those are lessons I wish I had learned earlier. Um, maybe I wouldn't have made the choices I made, but I don't, you know, I think I was meant to go through the journey I did. Um, maybe others had benefited from it. Maybe I was supposed to pay a price and others were supposed to benefit. I don't know. I don't know the reasons, um, but it happened. And, you know, I tried to make some lemonade out of it. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, knowing the reason, I think we'll, we'll never know, right? But we all have to, you know, like make our own reasons. So like for you, like, you know, you, you, you know, you may, have made your own reason in your mind is like is is one way of how we like i think human how we yeah how we sort of process life but i think your mom definitely was a very wise woman i think when she said to you like when you were inside just said you must be here for a reason and obviously this was you know because you you know you're fighting and you had all these um how do you say in english uh, when the wind goes against you you know, uh, like when things goes against you all the time, you know, like, like there were things that kept going against you, against you, against you in the legal system. And the system was failing you all the, all the time. And, you know, when she said you must be there for a reason, I mean, I, when I read that for me, it made so much sense. Cause I'm like, but it's, I don't, if I say it, I don't want it to be, you know, it's going to come across flippant cause I'm not the one who went through your experience, but the way I read it is like, cause you've given so much back, John. You know, even when you were in the prison and when you came out and you, you know, you were sort of, you leading by example and you managed somehow to find it in you to give back, even when your fate was still undecided and everything looked like the odds were against you. So, yeah, in a very twisted roundabout way, um, I, I mean, I believe, I, I believe so, but it's obviously very flippant of me to say, because I did not live that no, it's not life. flipping and i appreciate i actually really appreciate the way you just broke that down thank you for that <laughs> you're welcome um the last one is what do you not put up with anymore i don't put up with toxicity or drama i try to limit i try to limit drama of course we're all going to get some of that but toxicity <laughs> i'm not putting up with it if somebody's in my circle and they just no i have no time or patience i've you know I think we all sort of accept certain people and their behaviors because that's what we were told to do. But I don't care whose friend, whose husband, whose wife, I don't care. If you're toxic, I don't want to be around you. I don't make any bones about it. I don't need that. I, I try to stay positive. I try to create positive energy around me. I walk in a room. I like to bring positive energy. I like to receive it too. Like I said, I'm a vampire of energy. So I don't, I don't like toxicity. So mm -hmm. the negative people, I just don't tolerate anymore. I just I don't have the say, patience. When you say you're a vampire of energy, do you mean, do you mean like you, you're quite perceptive of, of other people's energies? You feel, Absolutely. you sense I, them, right? Yeah. Cause when yeah. I, when I, I only asked that for clarification and, and, and you, I, I knew that's what you meant, uh, but I just clarified it because I have a, this expression when I, I say that some people are energy vampires and it's not my expression. I got this from like, I don't know who, I think it was a, co a comic because I love, I love stand up. And uh, there's people who are energy vampire and mood hoovers, <laughs> mood hoovers. Yeah. Um, but you're not an energy vampire. You, you sense people's energy, like you're, you're, perce you're highly perceptive. Um, and yes, it makes sense that you'd want to, yeah, protect yourself from it. Um, 
because it's well, and I feed that's what I say. I feed off of people's positive when I, mm-hmm. especially young people, when I see that spark and that fire, and they're just trying to find a lane. I, I really enjoy that when I can somehow mentor or open a window or a door and yeah. let somebody really realize their potential because I love seeing it. You know, mm-hmm. like I said, I thrive off of that too. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 and some people you can see it in their eyes. You can tell they've got that potential mm-hmm. and they want to to do something. Before uh, you tell us where where we can buy your book and how we can work with you if you know if someone wants to have you to come over to do a talk, etc. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Anything that maybe I didn't give you the opportunity to do? Um, no, nah, nothing I can really think of. Um, I really appreciate you know your the opportunity to be on your podcast and use your vehicle to get word out and your audience to become more aware and educated on this. I think it's fantastic the work you're doing and exposing your audience to different topics and, you know, issues of the day. So thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what to say. I'm going to move on to the next thing. Can I, <laughs> where can, <laughs> thank you very much, John, uh, where can listeners uh, buy your book and yeah, and work with you and get, you know, if they want you to come and have it, do a talk for them, like how, how does that all happen? Um, so I have a website, John Huffington.com. That would be the, probably the best place to start or follow me on my Instagram, which is Huffington, John at Huffington, John. I keep that pretty updated. Um, I have Facebook as well. So the social media, I don't, I have Twitter and I'd hardly ever use it or whatever they call it these days. X. <laughs> But yeah, the Instagram is a good place. You know, I, it's public. You can follow me on Instagram at Huffington John or Huffington John. Um, my website is johnhuffington.com. My book's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. And for your European listeners, there's other outlets that I know but can't quote off the top of my head. So I would just say look for it, innocent and obscene miscarriage of justice, and keep listening to podcasts and these kind of opportunities as well. Yeah, you definitely can get it on Amazon. And also, uh, if anyone has the app that used to be called Scribd, which is now called Everand, E-V-E-R-A-N-D. It's like a subscription model for e-books, audio books, sorry, and uh, um, e-books. And there's a there's the e-book version on there that you can, if you subscribe to it. So um, and we hope to have the audio book out in mm-hmm. about a week. So we're trying to get it all done and engineered and uploaded so that it can coincide with my freedom day of july 22nd so yeah. look for yeah. that as well i'm actually hoping to maybe like release your episode on that same day oh that'd be great yeah would that be okay yeah so then i'll do absolutely that then, oh, that'd then be i'll great. do that yeah so basically today is your freedom day <laughs> there you go i like that thank you <laughs> yeah thank you so much and i see it was a such a pleasure and i'm um yeah honestly i i don't have any any words but i'm i'm really really grateful that you came on thank you so much Thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. And that's our episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend. It can be a screenshot that you text them, a link, the name of it, any of those will do. If you give a five-star rating and a review, that really, really helps the algorithm for it to be shared on all the different platforms. And just a little note, please be aware that this podcast is always free to listen to. Any platforms that want to charge you for it are doing so without my consent, okay? This is free. You can listen to it on Apple, Spotify, all of the other regular listening platforms that don't charge you. This is free. So don't let someone charge you to listen to my podcast. Until next time. Using health inappropriately.